Hey, what's up? So, here I have this gamepad, or rather, a shell of it. I would probably need to make a separate video just to explain why it looks so similar to a pad of the second model of the Sega Mega Drive or Genesis. Long story short, in the early 90s in Lithuania, there were people who could afford to buy a Sega Mega Drive, and those that could not. Those that couldn't usually bought Famicom clones that looked like this or this. Of course, we perfectly knew it's not Sega, but at the time we would rather play bootleg Famicom games than no games at all. So this pad is from a such clone console I had. In fact, it's the only remaining thing that is left from that system. To make things worse, the original PCB is no longer working. You see, six years ago, for some reason, I decided to abuse this gamepad and so to say adapt it as a controller for my very first computer, a Soviet ZX Spectrum clone. I scraped off the epoxy blob and soldered these thick ugly wires to the PCB. But now I kinda interested to return this gamepad's former functionality back. I want to recreate what that epoxy blob on the PCB was doing, so I could connect this pad back to my Famicom and play some games. This is going to be my main goal for this video. It's like those fake restoration videos, you know, the same guy ruins an item and then supposedly restores it, so that's what I'm doing. You might notice that for a Famiclone controller this gamepad has a very unusual number of buttons. Only the first two, A and B, are the normal NES buttons. The C is a combination of A and B and the upper row of grey buttons are the turbo buttons. So technically this controller still has 8 main inputs as a normal NES pad. If I would change the current connector to DB9 without any other modifications, it would be probably good enough for the Atari 2600 or Sega Mega Drive. Of course, on the Sega console only one action button would work, because every wire in this cable is dedicated to a single button input. That is four directions and one action. Add a ground wire and you will get six wires in total. Meanwhile, the NES or Famicom is a bit more advanced and expects a serial input where all the button presses are transmitted through a single data wire. For that work, we're gonna use a shift register IC. This chip has exactly 8 inputs and can pack them into a single data stream. So for all these inputs on the gamepad, we will need only 5 wires. Two of them are 5 volts and ground, the rest are the latch, clock and data. The latch controls the output of the shift register and the clock is basically the frequency in which the bits are outputted. The data of course is the output, where all the key presses are. For the turbo buttons we will use the 555 clock chip. I will definitely need to make a new PCB here, since the original one is designed to work with the epoxy blob in mind and it would be impossible to attach this old school dip ICs to it. But first I need to make a prototype to make sure everything would work. I'm going to use the DB9 Atari style connector since many Chinese clones including this Cyber Warrior had it. I already have an adapter for the Famicom's expansion port wired as a player 3 so it will be easy to test the gamepad. So I have this cable here, unfortunately it's white, but it will do. Let's attach the DB9 connector to the one end of this cable. I'm going to cut a piece of this prototype board and attach all five wires from my cable to it. I'm going to remove the old massive wires from the original gamepad's PCB and solder new 8 wires for each button. Later I will attach them to my prototype board. So basically we will have inputs from all 8 main buttons. 
After connecting the wires, I can put the original PCB back to its shell and assemble the gamepad. As you see here, I already labeled the bottom wires on the board and the wires that will go to the fan. Now let's add the socket for the shift register chip. Okay, the socket for the 4021 chip is pretty much wired. Now we need to attach some button from the gamepad as an input in order to test it on the Famicom. So let's start from mm, the start button. So I'm gonna connect the start button first. What the heck is going on? It looks like as if the start button is pressed repeatedly, but I'm not pressing anything. This happens because the chip is not sure it's getting one or zero value from the input. Logic circuits can have this third state where it's neither true or false. To get rid of that state we're going to use a pull-up resistor for every button. In this case I'm going to use a 10k ohm resistor. The one end of the resistor will be attached to the buttons wire while the other will be connected to 5 volts. So let's connect all the 8 buttons and their pull-up resistors. After the job is done, let's test the gamepad again. What do you know? Now it works pretty well. I could even end my testing here. But I still need to add the turbo functionality. So let's attach the socket for the 555 chip and wire it up to the PCB. This chip will going to generate the square wave for the turbo buttons. I'm going to use the A stable mode of the timer and the frequency how often the button is pressed could be set by adding fitting resistors using this formula or you can use this online calculator. After testing I realized I made a mistake. Apparently instead of the ground the turbo button should use the turbo signal. So I had to open up the case and attach another wire to the turbo signal. So now I can clearly see that I am feeding a 15Hz signal to the gamepad. So it's 15 button presses per second. I figured, you know what, just a simple turbo signal is kinda boring. Let's add a switch to switch between three different frequencies. But what frequency should I use? To find the answer I took apart the PC Engine gamepad and measured the frequencies it uses with my oscilloscope. So it turned out the PC Engine gamepad lets you set two turbo frequencies, that is 14Hz and 7Hz. These frequencies are what most normal people would pull out. Even though if you think about it, it's kinda hard to make 14 presses in a second. Since I managed to acquire a 3 state switch, I decided to add a third frequency that would be unrealistic 30Hz or 30k presses per second. So my frequency list consists of 30, 15 and 7Hz. So, my prototype was a success, so it was time to draw the schematic and design the final PCB that I'm gonna make. Compared to the stuff I made before, the schematic was extremely simple. 
Unfortunately, it wasn't that simple to design the PCB layout so that my added components would not interfere with buttons and it would be possible to close the gamepad's case. I've chosen to make a one-sided PCB so I could attach all the components to the backside. There was a, a lot of room in there. Probably it would have been smart to use SMD components, but I picked the ultimate way of a caveman and stick to the THT. I guess I really like drilling those holes after all. What really bothered me at first was that I could not find footprints that would look similar to the button plates on the original PCB. So instead I had to use some basic footprints with two contact plates. Later I found out you can actually modify them, so I started making something that would resemble the contact plates on the original gamepad's PCB. Of course, I got lazy and made only one variation for all the buttons. So finally I had a first version and printed it out to see what I did right and what's wrong. And it turned out my board was complete rubbish. The components and buttons were spread out a bit too much, so I had to fix that. Also this time I added mounting holes. So I was going back and forth like that until I had a version that seemed good enough. So I printed it and glued on a thick cardboard. I punched the holes and even put in the chips and resistors. I wanted to make sure I could close the lid of this gamepad. After a few small tweaks I was ready to etch the PCB. So as usual I cut out the piece of a laminate, a little bit bigger than the size of my PCB, printed the layout on a magazine paper and ironed the print onto the laminate. The first results were pretty good, so after minor fixes with the marker I prepared the solution. This time I tried to etch with an already used sodium persulfit solution, the same solution that I etched my cartridges with. I heated it up to 40 degrees of Celsius and put the PCB in. To my surprise the reaction didn't take place and I was already afraid it's not gonna work and I will need to buy some new sodium persulfit powder. But I think when the solution reached a bit higher temperature like 50 degrees, something started happening and I successfully etched the PCB. So I cleaned off the toner, cut off excess laminate and filed the PCB to its final shape. So you can see here the whole PCB evolution process, how many iterations there were until I finally etched the layout. Since I've already tested the cardboard version of my PCB, I had no problems putting it into the case, everything just clicked. Then I drilled the holes for the components and wires. Also I made the holes a bit bigger with a thin file. Then using the desoldering braid I covered the copper with a protective layer of solder. For the basic test I needed just to solder in the shift register and 8 pull up resistors. And here I've noticed that something is wrong. The diagonal directions did not work completely, no matter how hard I pressed the D-pad. Also I completely ignored how the third buttons C and Z are wired on the original PCB and just connected wires to A and B. 
Instead I needed to make buttons with three contact plates. So after putting so much work, the PCB ended up being complete failure. I just had to take a short break and start designing the PCB all over. This time I took extra care measuring contact plate sizes and their placement on the original PCB. So my PCB button layout would be identical and there would be no mistakes. After etching the new PCB and soldering in the shift register, I was eager to test it. Will it work this time? Well, the C and Z buttons worked fine, but the diagonal directions did not. What now? I kind of noticed that I need to press really hard on the rubber for the diagonal directions to work. And also remember that one of my viewers in previous videos said that uh, contact plates have to be extra smooth. And I will have hard time since I'm gonna cover the copper with solder by hand. So I grinded the plates with a desoldering braid and even sanded them with fine sandpaper. After that they looked pretty smooth, although I sanded off some solder in places. When I tested the pad I was amazed that the diagonal direction started working. Although it wasn't like ideal super perfect but it was good enough for a homemade thing. Perhaps in future I will learn how to cover my PCBs with metals using other ways than just messing with solder. Then I added the rest of the components. I cut off the rubber thingy from some old Famiclone controller wire and attached it to the end of the cable to protect wires from being pulled out from the PCB. The last task was to attach the turbo switch. I decided to cut out a hole on the side of the plastic case and glued the switch with some super glue. I hope it will stay in place. The connector looked ugly, so I bought a cheap DB9 plastic case. Although now with this case I can't connect it to the other Famiclones. I need to get into 3D printing and one day make something more appropriate for it. What was left to do was to put everything together and go play some games. The turbo function was definitely very useful in shooters like Gunag. It made the game super easy. The interesting find was that Super Mario USA doesn't work if you connect a third player controller through the expansion port. I had no idea. Even though I can switch between three turbo frequencies, I always use the 7 Hz frequency because it produces a nice stream of bullets and contra and not a short bursts like 15 and 30 Hz do. In most shooter games there is no much difference between 15 and 30 Hz, but I haven't tested them all. I can finally play Batman like I used to back in the day with the exact same controller and I can beat the game easily. So that proves the controller is not that bad. In the end I'm pretty happy with the results, although it was... A hard work, I finally have a working gamepad that is way better than it ever was. So that was my nostalgic passion project. Thanks for sticking with me till the end. I think in the next video I will try to make an NES Hello World application from start to finish in one session. So if you're interested then please subscribe the channel. So that's all for now. Thank you again for watching and hopefully see you next time. Bye.